It's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to uh, what pr promises to be an interesting lecture on the interplay of music and physics. Um, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Lori McNeil, who is here from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she's the chair of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. She's actually going to be doing three different categories of things here on campus. Um, one of the categories that she's here for is women in science. And in that area, she has experience as a former chair of the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, a member of a large number of uh, Climate for Women site visits, and a member of the delegation to um, the first international conference on women in physics in Paris a few years ago. So that she's meeting with a lot of groups on campus with an interest in this. She also has published on the subject of the two-body problem in careers. Not the two-body problem in physics, but the two-body problem of people looking for two positions in the same place. Uh, there's a website where you can look at the report if you're interested. The other thing she's going to be doing while she's here is, is being her professional self as a physicist. She's going to be giving a colloquium tomorrow afternoon at 4.10 in room 5 physics uh, on the subject of better lighting through chemistry. Um, and people are welcome to that as well with a reception beforehand in room, room 18 physics. The, the talk is in room 5 physics. And then tonight she's going to be talking about the interplay of music and physics. Oh, I suppose I should give you a little bit of the sort of standard boilerplate first. She was educated in chemistry and physics uh, with a bachelor's and a master's degree both in the same year in those two fields from Harvard. And then uh, five years later she earned her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana. She's had a number of recognitions in her scientific work and also in her work involved with uh, women in science. Uh, I asked her what her musical background was, and she tells me that she is a choral singer, has been for many years. Uh, she sings with the Choral Society of Durham, uh, who just performed St. Matthew's Passion by J.S. Bach with the North Carolina Symphony. That's a major, major undertaking. The Ames Choral Society is singing a lesser Mozart in a few weeks. Um, she also has played the violin and the recorder, and she teaches a, jointly teaches a course on the physics of musical instruments um, with a music faculty member. And I think we'll hear more about that, and so I'll, let you, I'll turn it over to you, Laurie. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here this evening to tell you about a subject that, although it's not my Focus, research focus as a professional physicist is something that I really enjoy learning about and teaching about. As Leanne mentioned, I do a teach a course I have now for a number of years with a member of the music faculty, who is in fact a professional cellist and, and early music specialist. And we have much more fun than ought to be legal in, in, in a college class. So I hope you get some of the flavor of that. What you're going to get is um, what I sometimes refer to as the one hour version of a course, of a one semester course that's too short. So there's going to be a lot of, of uh, compression here. There'll be a lot of things that I'll only be able to touch on. And I hope I will pique your interest and I'll give you some resources to learn more about these things if you're interested later. So there really are two questions that I want to address uh, today, one at greater length than the other. But they're questions that concern both physicists and musicians. And of course, sometimes those are the same people. Uh, one of them is, why do musical instruments make the sounds that they do? Why do they make the sounds they do and not other sounds? And the other is, why do we find some combinations of sounds to be pleasing and other combinations of sounds are not pleasing? So those are the two things that I'm going to be addressing. And the, the subject of physicists and music, it's a, it goes back <coughs> a long way. Uh, physicists have mathematicians. Uh, fundamentally to Pythagoras, and the school of Pythagoras in uh, 500 BCE or thereabouts, and the Pythagoreans discovered, or uh, perhaps not the first to discover this, but they were the first, certainly the first to write it down in ways that we uh, are, have access to, to understand the, the relationship of musical intervals, the intervals in a scale, to the ratio of the lengths of stretched strings that could be plucked to make a sound. And that the, the, the musical intervals that we consider to be consonant, considered to be pleasing, correspond to whole number ratios of those string lengths. Now, somewhat later, uh, Ptolemy looked at other kinds of scales. The Pythagoreans had very particular opinions about the appropriate ratios that one ought to use in music. They, they believed that number ruled the universe. 
And so they had very particular opinions about that. Ptolemy expanded on some of these uh, ideas to uh, show that different kinds of scales were possible beyond what the Pythagoreans considered to be the only natural and proper scale of the universe. Um, skipping ahead rather a lot in time, we have Galileo, who was the first that we're aware of to have, been, again, in records that we have access to, to postulate that consonant sounds result from two sounds having uh, periods, that is, periods of oscillation that uh, are multiples of one another. And I'll show a little bit more about that later. So he's really the first to point out what, of what does consonants or the pleasing sounds really consist. Uh, mathematicians certainly are familiar with the name of Mersenne. Those of you who are familiar with Mersenne primes might know this name. But his works on harmony and the laws of stretch strengths, what, what, the, uh, what is responsible for the frequency that a stretch string produces, uh, was a very important work in that period and was studied very much by composers as well as by scientists. Uh, he also made some of the earliest frequency measurements of musical sound. Uh, Hook, of course, is very well known to all students of elementary physics and beyond as the man with the wall about the spring. Uh, he also was, uh, uh, he was a contemporary of Newton's, and in fact, he and Newton had a bit of a disagreement about who was actually responsible for the universal law of gravitation. Uh, but he was, made some of the earliest frequency measurements uh, a little bit after Mersenne. Uh, Sauveur was... Uh, really, he's regarded as the father of acoustics, in really sort of looking at acoustics as a, uh, a discipline that one could, could make scientific statements about. And he explained the phenomenon of beats, when you have two sounds that are very close in frequency, and they combine to give you a single sound that has a changing volume. I think you've all experienced that phenomenon. He was able to explain that. And of course, uh, Fourier is responsible for, the, the mathematician and scientist was <coughs> responsible for our understanding that any sound, no matter how complex, is made up of the sum of combinations of pure frequency sounds, pure sine waves. And that turns out to be tremendously important in understanding musical sound, among much else. Uh, Savard is probably better known for his work in magnetism. Uh, an elementary physics student studied the bio savard law, magnetism. Uh, but he analyzed the vibrational modes of a violin body and tried to understand the ways in which a violin body vibrates. But the grand old man of this field is, is Hermann Helmholtz, who uh, wrote a, uh, a tome called On the Sensations of Tone, which was actually written as a popular science book of, of its day. And it was one that uh, musicians studied very carefully. And it, reading that book is like having a conversation with one of the great minds of the 19th century. Um, and reading it, it's quite striking that this was written for a popular audience, but it's, it's rather heavier going than the typical popular science book of today, I can suggest to you. Uh, but he also investigated not only a lot of the acoustical phenomena that, that I'll be speaking of, but also the phenomena of psychoacoustics which is how does the brain interpret the sound wave that arrives on, uh, on the eardrum. He actually started out in physiology, so he was very interested in the interaction of the human body with sound and the understanding of perception. And so he uh, made some of the first investigations in psychoacoustics. And then Sabine is one of the most important people in acoustical science, particularly in this country. Uh, he was a professor at Harvard and really revolutionized the field of architectural acoustics the interaction of the sound with the space in which it's, it's presented. So there's a long history of physicists and mathematicians being involved in and interested in music. And it's very common, in fact, for physicists and mathematicians to be amateur musicians like myself and many others, or uh, if not that, to be very great appreciators of music. Certainly in uh, concerts that are held by our music department in Chapel Hill, you will see more physics and mathematics faculty present there than you'll see music faculty. But of course, that's also their day job, so. <laughs> okay, so when we talk about musical sound, uh, physicists and musicians are talking about the same thing, but we use different language. And so it's important to look at the correspondences between the way the two groups will talk about the same thing. A musician will talk about a note by playing the middle C on the piano or whatever. The physicists, of course, will talk about a sound wave, because that's the, uh, uh, the manifestation of that note. 
The musician will talk about pitch. What's the pitch I'm playing? Where on the, the staff would I put that pitch? Where on the piano is that pitch? The physicist will talk about frequency, the frequency of the sound wave. That is, how many oscillations per second does that sound wave go through? The musician will talk about timbre or tone color. And this is really what distinguishes one instrument from another. When they're playing the same note, the same pitch, they will still sound different. The violin playing the same pitch as the flute, it will be easy to distinguish those two because they have different timbre or tone color. The physicists will talk about the frequency spectrum because the sound that you hear from that instrument does not consist of only a single frequency, but many different frequencies. And it's the spectrum or how much you have of each of those different frequencies that determines that tone color. The musician will talk about the attack and the release, how you begin and how you end a note. <coughs> uh, a physicist will talk, be the same thing when talking about the temporal envelope, that is the, the uh, shape in time of the sound wave. And finally, the musician will talk about loudness, how loud is the sound, is it forte, is it piano, and the physicist will talk about intensity to mean the same thing, the intensity of the sound wave, how much energy is in that sound wave, which we perceive as loudness. And of course, the notation is a little bit different for the two. <laughs> okay, so why do musical instruments make the sounds that they do? Why does the violin sound like the violin, the flute sounds like the flute, the voice sounds like the voice? Well, the fundamental reason is the frequency spectrum. Different instruments playing the same pitch will sound different because that pitch consists of more than one frequency. So the sound wave contains more than one frequency. And if you have different combinations of frequencies or different amounts of different frequencies, you will perceive the sound differently and you'll be able to distinguish one instrument from another. So here's an example of the sound uh, frequency spectrum of three different instruments playing the same note. Now, what we have on the horizontal axis here is frequency. So the frequency of oscillation of the sound wave. The vertical axis is intensity, or loudness, for the musician. And what you see is that um, all three instruments have the same set of frequencies. And in fact, those frequencies consist of the fundamental frequency, or the lowest frequency. That's the frequency that determines the pitch of the note. When we hear the note, what note, what, what letter do we assign that to? What pitch do we assign it to is determined by the fundamental frequency. The other frequencies that are present are integral multiples, whole number multiples of that fundamental frequency. So the next frequency that's present is twice the fundamental. The next one is three times, four times, five times, etc. So all of these instruments playing the same pitch have the same frequencies that are present. And yet, if you were to hear a recorder, a voice, and a violin all playing the same pitch, you would have no trouble distinguishing one from the other. You would know which one is playing, even with your eyes closed. And the reason for that is, you will, is what you can see here in the spectrum that the relative intensity of the different frequencies present in the sound is different for the different instruments. And so for the recorder, you get a lot of the fundamental frequency, much less of the next two, and then the, very, the higher frequencies are almost not present. So you're dominated by that fundamental frequency. You have very little of the rest of the other frequencies. For the voice, this happens to be mine, uh, you see a strong fundamental, but the next frequency up is almost as strong. The third one is rather weak, the fourth one is strong, and then the higher ones are, very, are not very much present. That gives the recorder and the voice a very different sound. They're easy to distinguish one from the other. The violin has an even more complex spectrum. In fact, the first uh, overtone is even stronger than the fundamental. And then the next one is, is uh, somewhat weaker. But then you have a very strong fourth frequency and so forth, including some quite significant intensity out of the higher frequencies. And so it's this, this mixture of different frequencies. Even though all the instruments are playing the same frequencies, they have them in different amounts. And that determines the, the, the tone color or the sound of that characteristic sound of that particular instrument. So why these frequencies and not other frequencies? Well, let's first think about waves on a string. You think about the violin, the, the thing that's vibrating, 
that makes the sound is the string. So we need to consider the vibrations of waves on a string. So suppose you have a stretch string. Imagine just like a, 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 a clothesline, for example, stretched between two poles. And you can send a pulse down that string. So suppose you take a broom handle and whack that, uh, that clothesline. You'll see a ripple that will go down to the other end of the clothesline. And in fact, it'll be reflective and it'll come back towards you. So you'll see that bump travel down to the end and then travel back to you. And um, that pulse will travel at a speed that's determined by the tension in the clothesline and also by the mass density, how thick and heavy that rope is. And it, as it turns out, the speed depends on those, uh, uh, those characteristics in that way. Now, the pulse goes down to the end and is reflected. And let's suppose that the string has a length that we'll call L. So this, this clothesline has a length L from one end to the other. The time that it takes for the pulse to, to go down to the end and come back is just twice the distance it has to travel divided by the speed, right? Because it has to go down and come back. So that, that's where the factor of two comes from. And suppose instead of just hitting the, uh, uh, the clothesline once, I hit it repetitively at some frequency, some frequency f. So every so often, I hit the, uh, the clothesline, I send another pulse. So now I've got a whole string of pulses going down, being reflected, coming back. Now, if I space my pulses out just right, then just when the first pulse arrives back, having gone down to the end, come back to me, just when it arrives back, I send another pulse. And so the pulse that's gone down and come back, and the next second pulse that I send will be at the same time, and they will add together, and I'll get a much bigger response. And I can keep doing this. And if I keep doing that, then I get the response that I get, that is the motion of the clothesline, builds up and builds up and builds up, and that's what we call a resonance. And so if I have as my frequency of getting pulses, the frequency is equal to just the um, one over the time that it takes for the pulse to return to the origin, I'm going to get a big response. But it would also work if um, I use these other multiples of that pulse. In other words, if instead of, of um, hitting the, the clothesline again just as that first pulse comes back, suppose I do it twice that often. Well, it's still going to coincide. Right? or three times that often, I'm still going to get a big response. So I get a big response, a big vibration from the string if I, make, if I uh, drive it at a frequency that, uh, that is equal to this value or to some integral multiple of it. So these are the frequencies that are going to give me a big response. Now if I do that with a, with a vibrating string, like a violin string, fixed at both ends, and now I'm going to make that string vibrate, here are the frequencies that will uh, give a big response and therefore uh, contribute significantly to the sound. And you see they're in integral multiples. I have my fundamental frequency, and then I have twice that frequency, three times it, four times, etc. Exactly the pattern that we saw in the frequency spectrum from the violin that I showed you a moment ago. And in fact, the, we can uh, determine the, these frequencies are in simple whole number ratios. And the pattern of the vibration of the string, if we were to look at that violin string, and we have to, to uh, take a video of it and slow it down because, of course, it's moving very rapidly, we would see that there are different modes of motion that the string can have. The mode that is at the lowest frequency is this black line here, where the middle of the string goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up, and then it goes down, and it vibrates in that way. That's what we call the fundamental vibration, the lowest frequency vibration. But the string can also vibrate in the way that this red line shows, where one side of the string goes up while the other side goes down, and then they exchange places like this. And there's a point right in the middle that doesn't move at all, what we call a node. That's the vibration at twice the fundamental frequency. We also have a vibration here, the green line, where the middle goes up and down, and the two sides go down and up. And I've run out of hands to do that, but you get the idea. So all of these different modes of vibration, each one corresponds to a different frequency. And in fact, 
The actual vibration of the string, when you pluck it, or if you draw the bow on the violin, will be a combination of all of these motions at once. And this is what Monsieur Fourier told us, that any sound can be, uh, any sound, no matter how complex, can, is made up of these discrete frequencies all added together. And that's, in, in the case of the violin, it's as a result of the vibration of the string itself and the, the different ways in which the string can vibrate. It does all of these at once, and therefore we see in that frequency spectrum each of these individual frequencies present in the sound spectrum, but no other frequencies. Because any other frequency wouldn't, the, the pulses wouldn't coincide, and so you wouldn't get this big response, you wouldn't get this resonance. And so, uh, so these are the frequencies that we get out of that violin string, and you saw them in the, uh, in the frequency spectrum that I showed you. So now we've got this violin string vibrating at these different frequencies, making up this complex sound that we recognize as being a musical pitch, and um, we actually want to play a tune. Well, how do we do that? Well, here's our frequency. Here's the fundamental frequency, which I told you determines the pitch of the sound. So if I want to change the pitch, when I want to change the note, I need to change the fundamental frequency. Well, there's several ways I could do that. The easiest way is to shorten the string. And I do that, of course, by putting my finger down on the string so a shorter length of it vibrates. Or the, the violinist's fingers on, on the fingerboard, or the guitarist, or whatever, it's all the same thing. So I can decrease the length. If I decrease the length, I will increase the frequency, the pitch goes up. And any of you are string players, guitar, violin, or whatever, know all about that. Now, I could also tighten the string. I could increase the tension. That would also increase the frequency. And, of course, when you're tuning your violin or your guitar or your cello or whatever, you tighten, you increase the tension by turning the peg to tighten the string and thereby cause it to have a higher frequency. That's not enormously practical when you're trying to play a melody. You don't want to do that by uh, tightening and loosening the string. It's much easier to, um, to shorten it by, by stopping it down with your fingers. But in principle, I don't know of any instrument that's, that's uh, uh, played that way. It would be a little impractical. Or, of course, you could reduce the mass density by using a thinner string. And you'll see uh, in any violin or guitar, you'll notice that the strings that play the higher notes tend to be finer strings, much smaller density, narrower strings. And that, uh, again, arises out of this. So, um, so the violin will play those, those frequencies and not any others. And you can change what the, the set of frequencies, when you actually play it, of course, you do that by changing the length of the strings. Okay. Um, now, I, I told you that those frequencies are in whole number ratios, and those are the frequencies that you get on the vibrating string. Well, what are the musical intervals that correspond to those frequencies? Well, you have your fundamental, is that's what I've called F1 here, so that's that lowest frequency vibration. The next resonant frequency is twice that uh, frequency, twice the fundamental. And the interval between those two frequencies, the first one and the second one, uh, which it's a factor of two, and that interval corresponds to the octave, or the distance between C and C on the piano. A uh, very familiar uh, interval to any musician. The next interval up is three times the fundamental, and the, uh, so that's three halves, or one and a half times, the second frequency. And the interval between that third frequency and the second frequency is the perfect fifth. So if we, we start it at uh, uh, middle C the, the, as our fundamental frequency, the next frequency up will be the octave of that, will be the C. The next frequency up will be the G above that, the perfect fifth. So the interval of the perfect fifth that any uh, musician will be familiar with comes right out of the basic physics of the vibration of the string. The next interval, four times the fundamental, so its ratio to the third frequency is four to three. And that interval is the perfect fourth from G to C. So already we've got uh, three of, well, four really, of the scale degrees. We've got the fundamental or, or the root tone. We've got the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, and the octave, all coming out of these vibrational nodes. The next interval, five times the fundamental, or a ratio of five to four from the fifth to the fourth, is the major third from C to E. 
The next interval, 6 to 5, is a minor third. So all of these intervals of our scale come right out of the vibrational modes of the string. The seventh interval, the ratio of 7 to 6, is not quite a minor third. It's a little bit smaller than a minor third. It's a little bit less than three semitones. So that, that, that seventh freak partial is, uh, is, doesn't fit neatly within our Western uh, scale. And so interesting things come as, uh, out of that. OK, so far I've just talked about the vi vibration of the string. Obviously, there aren't very many instruments that consist only of a string. Right, the the uh, well, Toronto Marina is one, but uh, most string instruments have a body to them. And it turns out that that body matters rather a lot, as you might imagine. Here's the, the, these are the vibration, the, the frequencies at which the string will vibrate. And the body of the instrument acts as an amplifier. So it will amplify some of those vibrations and not others. It will amplify some of them more than others. And so you can think of the, of the body of the instrument as being a selective amplifier. And so how you shape the body determines which frequencies are amplified more than others, and therefore what the tone color of the instrument is going to be. And as an example of that, this is what we call the 2 by 4 cello. This is my colleague, Brett Wissick, with whom I teach a class in this subject. He's a professional cellist and early music specialist who plays the viola da gamba, the teorbo, and a bunch of other instruments that I have trouble spelling. And this instrument here is a cello made out of two by fours. It is strung with cello strings. The distance of the length of the string from the nut to the bridge is exactly the same length as in uh, an ordinary cello. It's played, as you see, with a cello bow. And uh, this is the sound spectrum that it produces. This thing sounds ghastly. <laughs> it is painful to listen to. And the reason it's painful is you can see from the spectrum. You see very little of the lower frequencies, the, the one that determines the pitch, and some of these other frequencies that were very prominent in the violin spectrum that I showed you. And you see a lot of these high frequencies. This thing sounds like torturing a cat because it's got all these high frequencies, all these nasty, tinny sounds, and none of, or almost none, of the lower frequencies. So this is not something you would pay to listen to. This is. There he is playing his real cello. And I tell you, you would pay good money to listen to this man play the cello. And look at the spectrum. We see the fundamental is not so prominent. The, uh, the second partial, which is the octave, is even weaker. That third partial, which is the fifth, just sings out wonderfully. It's a wonderfully warm sound. This is a great job we get, by the way. And, uh, and so the, this combination of frequencies, with very little of these high frequencies, gives a wonderful warm sound that we are happy to listen to, that we find very pleasing. So the high frequencies here give us the, the nasty, tinny, edgy sound. The lower frequencies give us the sound that we describe as being mellow and warm. And believe me, you, you want to listen to that, and you don't want to listen to that one. So, uh, <coughs> so having a body matters, because it, the body will allow you to amplify those lower frequencies that otherwise would not be prominent. And the size of the body determines which of these frequencies get amplified, because it depends on the, 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 the size of the resonating cavity. If you think about that, if you have a large hollow object, and you thump on it, it makes a lower pitch than a smaller hollow object that you thump on. That it will, uh, the larger body will amplify lower frequencies. And um, this, as it turns out, is the origin of, what do you mean, any viola players in the room? No viola players? This is the origin of viola jokes. Any of you been in an orchestra where viola jokes get made? Yeah? And uh, this is why the violas are the butt of the jokes, because the viola is the wrong size. The size of the viola, if, if, if the viola were properly sized to, to properly amplify the frequencies that the viola is asked to make, it would be too big to put on your shoulder. And so the, the viola is made so that you can actually put it on your shoulder and not have it you know, be too far to reach. But as a result, it's undersized, and so it's underpowered. Like. The frequencies it's trying to make are not the ones that its body amplifies with. 
And so it's always a weaker sound. Always that the, you know, the violin will always uh, sound much louder than the viola, no matter how hard the viola plays. And as a result, the poor viola plays are always the subject of, of all the jokes that people make in the orchestra. And if you ask afterwards, I'll tell you a few. <laughs> so, one solution to this uh, was by Carly Hutchins, who uh, is a musician and um, instrument maker and amateur physicist who uh, made a very careful study of the sizing of stringed instruments and how they, uh, how they related to the frequencies that they were meant to amplify based on the notes that the instrument was supposed to play. And she produced what's called the new violin family. And this is a set of eight instruments of varying sizes, as you see. Each of one is sized properly to amplify the frequencies that it's meant to produce. Now, the, the modern violin is one of these because it turns out to be really just the right size. It's, uh, through all the years of evolution of this of development of this instrument, it's sized quite properly in a way that the viola is not. And the replacement for the viola is what's called the vertical viola. And you play it vertically. You don't play it on your arm, you play it underneath. It rolls on a small peg like that. And so it's properly sized. And we had a, a, a woman who had worked in Hutchins', uh, Hutchins uh, Musical Instrument Studio and is now retired at Chapel Hill bring in her vertical viola and the sound was amazing. It was incredibly loud. If you're used to listening to violas as these sort of subdued kind of instruments that sneak in in the middle of the orchestra, this thing just filled the room with sound. It was wonderful. And so these instruments have all been sized properly. They make a wonderful combination. And um, they, have, they haven't really caught on. And the problem seems to be not that they aren't wonderful instruments, which they are, but it's the chicken and egg problem. Until somebody writes music for these instruments, nobody wants to play them. And of course, if nobody's playing them, then nobody wants to write music for them. And so it's, they, they haven't really taken the musical world by storm. But from the physicist's point of view, and also from the point of view of the musicians who have played these, uh, these are exquisite instruments. And just somehow to try and get, get that going would, uh, uh, I think, be a, a service to the musical world. So. We've dealt so far with strings, but of course there's a whole wind family of instruments that we have to think about. And so we have to think about now the vibrations not of a string, but of a column of air, the column of air that is contained, for example, within a flute. The you know, flute is just, of course, a hollow tube, and it's the air inside the flute that vibrates. So now we have to learn about the physics of vibrating air columns and what frequencies do they produce? Well, the good news is that you already understand this because you've come to understand the vibrating string. And it turns out everything you know about vibrating strings comes directly over into understanding vibrating air columns. So let's think about a tube that has that's open at both ends, just like a mailing tube, for example. And let's think about the air pressure. The air pressure in that tube will oscillate. That's what a sound wave is, is an oscillation in air pressure. But because the uh, air at each end of the tube is in contact with the rest of the air in the room, the pressure at that point won't be able to deviate significantly from the pressure in the room. The room's much bigger than the tube. So we can think about, if we think about the air pressure in the tube, it behaves just like the displacement or motion of the string. Remember, the string was fixed at both ends. The two ends of the string didn't move. If we now, instead of thinking about displacement of the string, think about pressure, air pressure in the tube, we're going to get the same, exactly the same set of patterns. And so if this is, a, of course, exactly the same graph I just showed you for the vibrations of the string, but now it's representing the air pressure in the tube. So the lowest frequency vibration has a maximum oscillation of the air pressure in the middle of the tube that goes from very high pressure to low pressure to high pressure to low pressure and no oscillation at the ends. The second frequency is this one in red, and we get maximum oscillation of the pressure here and here, and the pressure remains constant in the center, and so forth. So exactly the same vibrational modes, the same set of frequencies, the same set of discrete frequencies. And we knew that had to be the case, because remember the frequency spectra I showed you of the violin and the recorder. One a vibrating string, one a vibrating air column, same set of frequencies. 
So we get exactly the same set of frequencies that we had for the violin, the violin string. So now we want to play a melody, just like we did on the violin. So here's our recorder. Here's our vibrating air column. And somehow we need to change its fundamental frequency so that it will play a different note. Well, we know that the, the lowest frequency determines the pitch, so we have to change that lower frequency, lowest frequency. So suppose we want to play a higher note. Well, what can we do? Well, we can decrease the length. And if we decrease the length, that will increase the frequency. How do we do that? Well, we can chop the end off. Uh -oh. That's a little drastic. It's a little more effective if you want to play more than one note uh, to not, not to decrease the actual complete physical length, but to decrease the effective length, to make it behave like a shorter tube. And we do that by poking holes in the tube and then uncovering them. And so if, if this hole here is uncovered, then now the air at that point in the tube is in much closer contact with the air in the room. And so its pressure, uh, the pressure at that point, will tend to be the same as the air pressure in the room and therefore constant. And so effectively, I will have shortened the tube by that much. And so I can do that just by opening and closing the finger holes. As anybody who plays a wind instrument is familiar with, or you may have on a modern fleet would have keys rather than just holes that you cover with your fingers, but it's exactly the same thing. Now my other choice would be I could, uh, if I, rather than shortening the tube, I could increase the speed of sound. That would drive the frequency up. So if I, if I wanted to, uh, uh, to change the pitch I was making, one way to do that would be to increase the speed of sound by increasing the temperature in the room. The speed of sound would go up. That's not very easy to do, especially if it's a rapid melody. Uh, so that's not too practical. So what one does instead is open, is open finger holes to change the effective length. Now, as I said, if you increase the speed of increase the temperature in the room, you increase the speed of sound, and therefore the frequency that the wind instruments play will go up because the length will remain fixed. However, if you increase the temperature in the room and you have a string instrument, what's going to happen to the string? And what happens when you heat up a string? What is that? What can you tell me? In the lower, exactly. So when the temperature goes up in the room, the strings go flat and the winds get sharp. And the whole orchestra goes up too. So this is one of those great musical ironies that physics causes. In any, uh, anybody playing in an orchestra has experienced this. Okay, what about... We talked about tubes with one end open. Now it turns out one can play some wonderful acoustic tricks by having one end of the tube be closed instead of open. So that end of the tube is no longer in contact with the room pressure and therefore is no longer constrained to remain at the air pressure in the room. Now that pressure at that point can oscillate. And when you do that, you end up with patterns that look like this. So now at your closed end, you have maximum oscillation. And at your open end, you still have the pressure fixed at the pressure of the room. And if you work out what those frequencies are, the lowest frequency is this here, the speed of sound divided by four times the length of the tube. Now, for if that end had been open, remember the lowest frequency was the speed of sound divided by two times the length of the tube. So this lowest frequency is now half of what the lowest frequency would be if this end of the tube were open. So the tube with one end closed, its fundamental frequency is one octave lower than the fundamental frequency of the same tube with both ends open. So by closing the end of the tube, you can now make it sound an octave lower. And also notice that the second frequency is not twice the first frequency, but three times. And the next frequency is not three times, but five times. So we go one, three, five, not one, two, three. So in a sense, the even frequencies are missing. So the tone color is going to be different. The timbre, the sound of the instrument will be different because an instrument that's functioning like a tube with one end closed will have only odd multiples of the fundamental frequency and no even multiples. 
And um, so only the odd numbers. And also, we get the lowest frequency is, uh, for, is half that of an open-ended tube of, of the same length. This turns out to be very useful. Those of you who uh, are uh, members of a church that has an, or a pipe organ, uh, of course, the length of the tube of the pipe organ is going to determine its fundamental frequency, and therefore the lowest note will be determined by the tallest tube that you can put in your church. Well, of course, you might run out of church before you run out of ambition to have a really low note, one of those wonderful low notes that kind of shape the whole church. Well, you can, in fact, if you make the tube have one closed end, its pitch drops by an octave. So two tubes the same length, one closed, one open, the one closed will sound an octave lower. So you can actually fit a much lower note into the church if you close it at one end. Now the tone color will not be quite the same because you won't have the even frequency. But once you get down to sort of 32 hertz and you're just kind of shaking the room, the tone color doesn't really matter that much. You're really not going to notice. Um, now everything I've been talking about so far has been tubes that are cylindrical. That is, they have the same cross-section everywhere down the length. Now, the flute has this cross-section. It's the same diameter all the way down the length. But, uh, and so does the clarinet, but the oboe does not. The oboe is a cone, kind of a narrow cone, but it's in a conical bore. It turns out, for uh, something that we won't explore at this level of detail, that the clarinet, being a cylinder, it functions as a tube with one closed end, because it's got the, uh, the mouthpiece at that end, with the reed, and you see it has odd, only the odd frequencies are present, the odd multiples. The oboe is essentially the same length, but it has both the odd and the even frequencies because it is conical. And it's, um, and, and if you think about the clarinet and the oboe, the lowest note that the clarinet plays is considerably lower than the lowest note that the oboe plays, even though they're about the same length. <coughs> And that's because the clarinet is cylindrical and the oboe is conical. And so the oboe functions equivalent to a pipe with, with uh, both ends open. So the shape of the bore also matters in a woodwind instrument, not just its length. So we've dealt with, with strings and winds, and now we want to turn our attention to percussion. Now percussion, um, the question, I mean, there are two kinds of percussion instruments, right? There, you can describe them as the things that go ding and the things that go clunk. That is the things that make a distinct pitch, like a xylophone, you can sing along with the xylophone, versus the things that don't make a distinct pitch, like a drum. And you can sing along with the drum, but you're singing along with the rhythm, and you're not playing a tune with a typical drum. And the reason for this is that in order to perceive that distinct pitch, the pitch that we can identify as having a particular note, something that we can sing along with, we have to have the frequencies of those uh, partials, the different frequencies present, be in those simple whole number ratios. That if we have a sound in which the different frequencies present are not in those simple whole number ratios, we don't perceive it as a distinct pitch. We don't perceive it as something that we can sing along with, that we can identify a pitch. Now, we've been looking so far at objects that are basically one dimensional. A string that's much narrower than its length, or an air column that's much narrower than its length. Percussion instruments are two and three dimensional objects. They're not very small, the, all the other dimensions are not very small compared to the length. And so they don't have these simple whole number ratios in their vibrational modes. Um, so for example, let's look at a vibrating rod, like the, the tubular bells, the orchestra bells that um, you know, play the church bells in, in the 1812 overture or the marimba, or the xylophone, or the wind chimes that you might have on your deck. Well, now here's lots of winds, there's probably lots of wind chimes. This is what the vibration of a, of a rod looks like if both ends are free. Now, you see, this is of course greatly exaggerated, the marimba doesn't you know, move by that much, but you see the same kind of patterns that you saw with the string. The lowest frequency has its maximum displacement in the middle, and then two points near the end now that don't move. Similarly, the second, third, and fourth frequencies. So these vibrations are not in whole number ratios. In fact, they're in the ratio of 1 to 2.8 to 5.4, etc. Not whole number ratios. So if you take your average hunk of wood and bang on it, you don't get a pitch 
that you associate, that you can sing along with. You don't get something that you really associate with a, uh, uh, with a real pitch. Um, so here's the set of ratios. They're not simple whole numbers. But you can take that rod and shape it, carve away some of the wood. And now you can start to enhance some of the parts and then change the frequencies at which they vibrate. And the marimba is a great example. So here are our vibrational modes of a simple rod. And we want to, we want to affect the, vib the frequencies of the vibrations differently because we want to bring them into whole number ratios. So in order if we want to lower the frequency of a partial, make it be lower, we reduce the thickness where the displacement for that partial is the greatest. And so we can carve away the bar into this shape, which is the typical shape for a marimba bar. If you ever go up and look at a marimba, you see they're thinner in the middle than at the uh, outside. And so by taking away uh, some of the wood in the middle, we've lowered the frequency of the first partial. And by taking away material at these points, we lower the frequency of the second partial, because those are the points where the displacement is greatest. And by balancing how much we lower those two, we can bring them into a whole number ratio by careful adjustment. And when we do that, then we end up with something that makes a distinct pitch. And certainly if you hear somebody play the marimba, that those are very distinct pitches. The other thing to notice is that the marimba bar is suspended. Typically, there's a hole that goes through the bar, and the bar is suspended on a pair of strings, a cotton string. And those holes are placed at the points that don't vibrate. So the presence of those uh, of that sub suspension string does not affect the vibration of the uh, instrument of, of the rod. So you can take something that doesn't have a distinct pitch because its frequencies are not in whole number ratios and adjust it to bring those frequencies into whole number ratios, and then you have something that makes a distinct pitch. It goes down instead of clunk. <coughs> um, and it's very interesting that, that the ear demands those whole number ratios, and will find them in any sound. And the, the tubular bells, the orchestra bells, the one that play the church bells in, in the 1812 overture, uh, they are simple, simple rods. They haven't been carved away like the marimba bar. Actually, they're hollow rods, tubes. Um, and it turns out that the fourth, fifth, and sixth partials, the fourth, fifth, and sixth frequencies in that spectrum, are in these ratios, because it's a simple rod. And that's 81 to 121 to 169, not simple, small whole numbers. But if you divide out the lowest common denominator, this turns out to be 2 to 2.99 to 4.17. Let's go through the division. And that's awfully close <coughs> to two to three to four. It's close enough for the ear to hear those, those frequencies in the sound, hear frequencies that are in the ratio of two to three to four, and say, aha, those are the second, third, and fourth partials of a fundamental frequency that is one half of this, of the fourth partial, or an octave below the fourth partial. And to hear that as a pitch associated with that, with an octave below that fourth partial, and so you hear a pitch that isn't there. That frequency that you're hearing, that you would sing along with the bell, isn't present in the spectrum. But your ear grabs on to these partials that are present, and that very close to a, a, a simple whole number ratio and interprets it as being the second, third, and fourth partials of a frequency that's not present in the system. So the ear is, uh, the interaction of the ear and the brain is, <coughs> is a very mysterious and interesting thing, but the brain really wants those simple whole numbers. Now, the drum. A typical drum head uh, is a two-dimensional object. It's Different modes of vibration are not in simple whole number ratios. And so th these uh, little cartoons here represent, if you think about a drum head, of course it, it's fixed around the rim, and its lowest mode of vibration is the simple one that's sort of like the string. The middle goes up and down, and the rim doesn't move, and that's the simplest mode. The second mode is one where ha one half is going up while the other half is going down, just like the string. 
And then there's another mode where it's divided into four parts and you have two noble lines and so forth and so on. So all of these different modes of vibration exist and when you whack the drum, you'll get some of all of them. But they're not in simple whole number ratios and so you don't see here a, a distinct pitch. However, if you think about the timpani or the kettle drums in an orchestra, those do have a distinct pitch. You, they will play a tune on the kettle drum. And so how does that come about? Well, just like you might expect, it's because of the kettle, that copper kettle um, that contains air. And the air in the kettle, the, the kettle is, is, is uh, sealed. There, there's a little hole at the bottom, but the amount of air that can escape through that is, is quite small compared to the actual size of the kettle. And so, having the, so when the, the drum head vibrates, it's got to compress the air in the kettle. The air can't just get out of the way. It actually has to be compressed. So that adds an additional mechanical load on the membrane. And it modifies the frequencies of vibration of that membrane and it modifies the different modes differently. And if you have the right size kettle, you end up with frequencies that are, in fact, much closer to simple whole number ratios. So without the kettle, the ratio of the second to the third frequency is, is 1 to 1.35, and then 1.45, and so forth. So not simple whole number ratios. When you add the kettle, though, you end up with ratios of 1 to 1.5. That's our perfect fifth, three halves. And then the 1.65, that's not a pretty good harmonic. But here's our major seventh and the octave. So by adding the kettle, we've modified the frequencies to bring them into those whole number ratios, and now we have something that sounds a distinct pitch. And another way to do that is done in some instruments in, uh, from Asia. These are our Indian tabla. And the way they've changed the, uh, the frequency is, I mean, there, there is a, a body here, but it's open at the bottom. And what they've done is they've applied a paste to the drum head. They, they take rice paste and mix it with metal shavings, so they make it very heavy. And they apply that paste to the surface and then let it dry. And that gives mechanical loading, additional load to the drum head. And it modifies the frequencies and it modifies the different vibrations differently so as to bring them into whole number ratios. And so you can get a distinct pitch. These are used to accompany singers, not just in rhythm, but also in pitch. So a different way of doing the same thing. Um, the material of which the instrument is made uh, matters in some cases more than in others. Um, the, one of the open questions in musical acoustics is what really makes a Stradivarius a wonderful instrument in the way that the violin I have that we bought from Sears is not a wonderful. Well, this is an exaggerated view of the vibrations of the violin body, because of course, the violin body vibrates as well. The string makes, the bow make, or plucking makes the string vibrate, the string makes the bridge vibrate, the bridge makes the body of the violin vibrate. And in fact, it, uh, if you, someone is playing violin, you go up and touch the, the body of the violin, you feel it's vibrating quite significantly, and that's how the amplification takes place. So the material of which the, uh, the violin is made does matter, but it's not clear whether what makes the Stradivarius so wonderful is the exact nature of the wood that it's made up of, the grain, the, uh, the particular, you know, how dense the grain was because of how many rainy years they've had in Cremona in the last few years before the trees were cut and all that sort of thing. Uh, is it the varnish with which the wood is coated that certainly affects its mechanical properties? Um, there is some uh, chemicals that were used to prevent uh, wood borers from eating their way through the wood before you can make it into a violin. It may be that that is partially responsible for the sound of the instruments. This is not something we understand well at this point. However, when it comes to a woodwind instrument, things are a little less ambiguous. Um, there are people, professional flute players, who, including uh, a member of my own faculty, in the music department at Chapel Hill, who swear by uh, having a platinum head joint and my colleague believes that this platinum head joint is far superior to the head joints that he's had made out of other materials. And he's convinced that it's because of the material of which it's made. Well, the physicist has a problem with that because the head joint isn't doing the vibration that produces the sound, it's the ear con. It does vibrate just a little, uh, but that vibration is at very high frequency compared to the fundamental frequency of the flute. So there's no way that the vibrational characteristics of that head joint can make a significant difference in the sounds of the flute. 
And in fact, this, uh, some physicists played kind of a dirty trick on some flute players a number of years ago at a convention, which uh, the professional flute players were asked to uh, compare the sound of two flutes uh, being played behind a curtain so you couldn't see what the flutes were like, and to choose which one had the better sound. And it turned out that the one that they really liked was one that was made out of cement. <laughs> so the material is not the most important thing in a woodwind. Now, if you're making a flute out of cotton versus out of cement, chances are you're going to take a little more care with the workmanship, that you're going to be very careful with this precious metal that you're working with, so you may very well get a much better instrument that's made out of platinum. But that's not because of the platinum, it's because of the, the uh, workmanship and care you put into that. Another, uh, well, and the physicists uh, keep saying this, and the flute players don't seem to quite believe it. Uh, Paula Robeson, of course, is a wonderful professional flute player, and she says that we all know that wood flutes are much more dolce, much sweeter. A gold flute sounds like an instrument made of gold. I have no idea what she means by that. Uh, the silver flutes are much more perky. So perception is one thing and physics is another, and both of them play a role in music. Another uh, point that the material matter that, that uh, had, had a big vogue about 20 years ago among brass players was, and, and you can still get this done, there's still companies that you can pay to do this, is you take your brass instrument, your trumpet or your French horn, and you uh, cool it down using liquid nitrogen vapor. You cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperature, and then you warm it back up again. And um, the, the people who do this for a tidy sum say that it releases residual stresses. Now, maybe there's some metallurgists in the room who um, are thinking about this and saying, my goodness, that's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. It doesn't do that. And in fact, the vibration, again, the vibration of the wall of the brass instrument is not what determines the sound. That's a very small effect on the sound, even though it actually vibrates much more than in the case of a woodwind instrument. And I have, again, a colleague in the music department at uh, Chapel Hill, a trumpet player, who I've been telling him for years that, that having had his, his trumpet uh, cryo treated did not, in fact, change the sound. Um, and he says, well, okay, I, I, find, I do believe you, but it makes me feel like it sounds better, and so I play that. <laughs> and I can't argue with that. <laughs> Particularly since he's a wonderful trumpeter. So the material of which the instrument is made does matter, but not always as much as the players think it does. Okay, I did promise to tell you a little bit about uh, combinations of sounds and why we find some of them pleasing and some of them not so. And I alluded to this earlier when I told you a little bit about Galileo. Here are frequency, the frequency spectrum, or the simulated spectrum, for three pitches that would make up our uh, major triad, a major triad. And so, uh, so we have the, uh, the lowest note, the higher and higher, and as you see, the frequencies, the, the lowest note, the A, ha shares frequencies with the E, which is a perfect fifth above it. That the third partial of the lowest note matches the second partial of the upper note, and then here and there. And so you have the same frequencies present in each of these different mu musical pitches. And so our ear finds that pleasing because the frequencies match up. And then somewhat less so with this major third here in the middle. And in fact, in Western music, we now consider both of these intervals, the, the perfect fifth, the ratio of 1 to 3, and the uh, 1 to 1.5, and the major third, the ratio of, four, of uh, 5 to 4, to be consonant intervals, to be pleasing intervals. But in earlier centuries in Western music, well, the, the perfect fifth was always considered to be consonant. Even the Pythagoreans thought so. But the major third was not considered to be a consonant or pleasing interval in, say, medieval music. It was something that you, you did not have that interval in your music because it was considered to be unpleasing. The Pythagoreans thought it was very ugly. We today think of it as being beautiful. But um, what makes two pitches consonant you know, is this overlap of their frequencies. And the more that the, pit, the frequencies overlap, the more likely we are to consider that to be a pleasing interval. So if you look at 
uh, integrals that are considered to be consonant or pleasing in different cultures, you'll find that the octave, the perfect fifth, and the perfect fourth are pretty much universal. But other intervals, like the major third, do not necessarily uh, appear in the scale and aren't necessarily considered to be consonant. Necessarily considered to be consonant. Necessarily considered to be consonant.